Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this public lecture by the Commonwealth Lawyers Association. My name is Maria Mbeneka. I am your host together with Linda Kasonde uh, from the Commonwealth Lawyers Association. And we are very, very excited to have with us this afternoon, Dr. Fatu Bensuda, who is well known to a lot of us. And she is a former prosecutor at the International Criminal Court. Um, this public lecture is basically to mark the International Women's Month uh, this year, 2022. And you know that the, the theme for this year is Break the Bias. So we are very, very excited to have Dr. Ben Suda with us, who will be speaking to us. And um, like I said, I'm joined by Linda Kasonde, who's our president, uh, sorry, our vice president for Africa at the Commonwealth Lawyers Association. And she is the first Zambian woman to hold a position um, where, and she has practiced for a very, very long time uh, within the Commonwealth and within Zambia. I'm also joined by the president of the Gambian uh, Law Society, and that is Salu Tal. He's a managing partner at Temple Legal Practitioners, and he's going to be um, giving the close the vote of thanks at the end of this session so without further ado and because we don't have a lot of time i'd like to invite my colleague um, linda kasonde to take it from here welcome linda thank you maria and good afternoon to all of you out there <clears throat> welcome to the second of our public lectures to mark international women's day um, we are delighted to have with us the former ICC prosecutor, Dr. Fatu Bensuda, who hails from the Gambia. Um, as Maria mentioned, I'm the Vice President for Africa of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association. I chair the Africa hub of the uh, association. The CLA is uh, a uh, an organization that represents uh, lawyers from across the Commonwealth. To date, we have about 50 different countries represented. Uh, the aim of the CLA is to promote and protect the rule of law and human rights across the Commonwealth. And we do so through various means, such as public statements, uh, engagements with officials, and also events such as these. Um, I'd also just like to flag that um, we'll soon be having our next uh, biennial conference, which will be held in Goa, India in 2023. And I can speak to, more, to that a bit more at the end. We look forward to um, you all becoming members of our association. Please see our website for more details. I will now introduce our guests for today, Dr. Fatu Bensuda. Dr. Bensuda served as prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, the ICC, from 2012 to 2021, having assumed office in 2012. In 2011, she was elected by consensus by the Assembly of State Parties to serve in this capacity. Dr. Bensuda was nominated and supported as the sole African candidate for election to the post by the African Union. She's the first woman to serve as prosecutor of the ICC. Her nine year mandate as ICC prosecutor ended on the 15th of June, 2021. Under her leadership, Dr. Bensuda has greatly reinforced the capacity of her office through a number of strategic and managerial initiatives and expanded her officer's activities to cover 14 investigations and countries' active preliminary examinations in conflicts around the world. Through her work, she has strived to advance accountability for atrocity, for atrocity crimes, highlighting in particular the importance of addressing traditionally underreported under crimes, such as sexual and gender-based crimes mass atrocities against and affecting women, children, as well as the deliberate destruction of cultural heritage within the Rome Statute framework. Between 1987 and the year 2000, Dr. Bensuda was success, successively State Council, 
senior state counsel, principal state counsel, deputy director of public prosecutions, solicitor general and legal secretary of the Republic of Gambia, and attorney general and minister of justice of the Republic of Gambia. Her international career as a non-government civil servant formally began at the UN International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, where she worked as a legal advisor and trial attorney before rising to the position of senior legal advisor and head of the legal advisory unit from 2002 to 2004. After which she joined the ICC as the court's first deputy prosecutor. Dr. Bensouda has served as delegate of the Gambia to inter alia the meetings of preparatory commission for the ICC. She's the recipient of numerous awards, including the distinguished ICJ International Jurist Award received in 2009, presented by the then president of India, P.D. Patil. She's also the recipient of the 2011 World Peace Through Law Award presented by the Whitney Harris World Law Institute, the American Society for International Laws Honorary Membership Award received in 2014, and the 35 Peace Prize by the United Nations Association of Spain received in 2015. In addition to receiving several honorary doctorates, Dr. Bensuda has been listed on two occasions by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. That was in 2012 and 2017. And by the New African Magazine as one of the most influential Africans. Foreign policy also listed her as one of the leading global thinkers in 2013. And Jeune Afrique as one of 50 African women who by their actions and initiatives in their respective roles advanced the African continent. That was received in 2014 and 2015. And in 2020, Forbes magazine listed her as one of Africa's 50 most powerful women. In 2018, Dr. Bensuda received the Bled Strategic Forum's Distinguished Partner Award for the continuous commitment on her, on her part and on the part of the ICC to international peace and justice. In the same year, she was invited and joined the eminent roster of the international gender champions. Prior to the end of her mandate, Dr. Bensouda was awarded l'Ordre National du Lion de Senegal by the president of Senegal for her dedicated service in the advancement of international criminal justice and her native country, the Gambia, announced that she will be awarded the country's highest civilian honor for her principled service as ICC prosecutor. At the end of her mandate in 2021, Dr. Bensouda was awarded the Outstanding Achievement Award by the International Law Association American Branch and the Sapienza Human Rights Award from the Sapienza University in Italy. She has been chosen to receive the 2022 Prominent Woman in International Law by the American Society of International Law. Dr. Bensouda and the office she led as ICC prosecutor have also been nominated for the 2021 Nobel Peace Prize in recognition of their accomplishments and work in advancing international criminal justice without fear or favor. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot think of a more eminently qualified person to deliver this year's International Women's Day uh, speech on behalf of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association. So without further ado, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Fatu Bensouda. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Vice President. Um, thank, you to all, thank you all, the leadership of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association Africa Hub for inviting me to address you and for organizing this timely conference to commemorate International Women's Day in the month of March, which we now fully recognize 
as the international month to celebrate us. And what better time to commemorate us and talk about the various challenges we continue to face day in, day out at all levels. I also wish to, I also wish to thank all of those who have contributed to convening this important event and to our very own Salutal for reaching out to make the connection for this auspicious occasion. Thank you, sir. I am truly delighted to be in the company of so many of you and committed allies in our collective struggle to eradicate gender inequality and injustices against us. And in this address, where I talk about my career path, I wish to draw your particular attention to sexual and gender-based crimes, the violence, you know, whether it is at the domestic level or at the international level, but particularly during conflict. In this International Month of the Woman, I cannot think of a better time to highlight what our women folk have suffered and continue to suffer in both times of peace and during conflict. I will come back to address this later. Let me first mention my trajectory in law and justice and where it all began. As you already know, I was born, bred and buttered in the Gambia at a time when girls' education was culturally not of that much importance. Until then, the girls that would go through higher education were far fewer than our male counterparts. And this is simply because girls' education in the Gambia at that time, and also, I may say, in most parts of Africa for that matter, was not seen as important. And that girls' education, even at the, high, at the level of high school education was already too high. You see, from the onset, there has been a set limit to which girls can reach in their education. I am particularly pleased with my dad that he was living in advance of his age, for he thought that boys and girls must be equally educated. He was really living beyond his, his times. He gave his education, his children, both boys and girls equal opportunities. So from a very early stage for us, there was no glass limit. And even if there was, it was meant to be shattered. I did my primary school education in the Gambia. At that time, university education, especially for professional courses like law, engineering, architecture, or medicine, et cetera, were not available in the Gambia. If however you pass well, to qualify for such courses at university level, you could be awarded a government scholarship for further studies abroad in, the, in any Commonwealth country that offers those courses or so. And, and you can go abroad if your own parents, if your parents could afford it on your own. And of course, it was a cause of great concern when you do not know how to do your higher high education especially when you know that your parents are not able to afford it. Your only opportunity should be to work very hard and be able to win the scholarship. And you can be assured that I worked extremely hard to make the scholarship and was very pleased when I was uh, afforded that opportunity to go to Nigeria, University of Ife, which is now the Obafemi Awolowo University to study law. It was very clear to me uh, from a very early age, driven by an innate sense of justice, that I wanted to study law. And this desire was fueled further when I took up employment at the law courts immediately after completing my A-levels and sat in cases as a court clerk. I think this term is familiar to all of us as uh, Commonwealth law lawyers. I am reminded of those formative years when I worked as a clerk of court at the high court in the Gambia. And we all have those moments uh, that leave a mark and help us determine our trajectory in life. 
Attending those court hearings, I recall witnesses, witnessing many women, victims of rape, as well as other forms of sexual and domestic violence, who had to relieve their ordeals through a judicial system which was not able to afford to fully afford them the protective embrace of the law. Their despair, their agony and suffering remain vivid and etched in my memory. I knew from that moment that through the vector of the law, vulnerable groups in society can and must be protected and afforded a measure of justice. For as long as I can remember, I have felt that justice is the oxygen of the soul. We all need it for a sustenance. My path had been made clear. And these convictions were only reinforced through my experience at the UN International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, where my work exposed me to the horrors that unfolded during the Rwanda genocide against the Tutsis, where the evil of tribalism unleashed its fury with unrestrained violence, spilling the blood of the innocent, and in turn, in turn, tainting our times with one of the worst episodes of mass slaughter. Rapes, sexual slavery, and sexual violence was the order of the day, demonstrating that, as always, that women and girls remain the most vulnerable in society during conflict. They bear the brunt of these dreadful wars and senseless violence. And it is as if the wars were fought on the bodies of women. <clears throat> Genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity have a particularly devastating effect on women and children. Women, girls, children in general may be the direct victims. They may be forced to participate in the commission of crimes, or they may witness the commission of these crimes against others, including their own families. The women who survive this sexual violence, sexual slavery, forced pregnancies, and other forced relationships were profoundly traumatized physically and emotionally by their life in captivity. After the conflict, many were considered ineligible for marriage, and their forced marriages generated yet another category of victims, children born from those forced relationships. So even after conflict, women continue to be affected, even during peace times. And too often, there is a tacit agreement to look the other way when women and girls are sexually violated and abused. Minimizing, trivializing, denigrating, and silencing, silencing the victims. It requires tremendous courage for a survivor of sexual violence to share their most private and painful memories of what happened to them under cover of darkness. There has indeed been a remarkable evolution over time in the international commitment to ensure accountability for sexual violence in conflict. You will recall that Robert Jackson, the chief prosecutor of the Nuremberg Tribunal, did not present sexual crimes in the cases against Nazi leaders. The Rome Statute, which establishes the International Criminal Court, however, expressly proscribes various forms of sexual and gender-based violence including rape, sexual slavery, enforced prostitution, forced pregnancy, enforced sterilization, and other forms of sexual violence as the underlying acts of both crimes against humanity and war crimes. And the statute criminalizes persecution based on gender as a crime against humanity. As chief prosecutor and head of the office, I saw my position as an opportunity to do as much as possible to bring justice to victims. I was conscious that at all times, victims must remain at the heart of our work. The court's rules of evidence and procedure reflect progressive advancements at the international level in protecting victims of sexual and gender-based crimes. Article 54 of the statute specifically mandates me as prosecutor then to ensure effective investigations and prosecutions by taking into account the nature of the crime, in particular, where it involves sexual violence, gender violence, or violence against children. 
Article 681 of the statute states that the prosecutor of the court shall take measures to protect the safety, physical and psychological well being, dignity and privacy of victims and witnesses, particularly in relation to sexual and gender based crimes and crimes against children. Additionally, Article 21.3 requires that the application and interpretation of the Rome Statute must be consistent with internationally recognized human rights and therefore without any adverse distinction founded on grounds such as gender. Yet another groundbreaking feature of the Rome Statute is the central role of victims as participants in the court's proceedings and the recognition of the interests of victims in the statute. During my tenure as prosecutor, I have devoted special attention to enhancing the effectiveness of my office's investigations and prosecutions of these crimes. The task of achieving tangible results in court for the prosecution of sexual and gender-based crimes is replete with challenges. At both the national and international level, these crimes are systematically underreported. It requires tremendous courage for a survivor of sexual violence to push through the feelings of shame and to testify before an international court. Social stigma combined with the passage of time and the limited forensic or documentary evidence due to inadequate support services at the national level make it very challenging to effectively prosecute sexual and gender-based crimes. As such, when I became prosecutor of the ICC in 2012, and using this, as I said before, as an opportunity, I made a personal commitment to develop and put in place a comprehensive policy to guide my office's investigations and prosecutions of these crimes. In June of 2014, I launched the office's landmark policy on sexual and gender-based crimes. And the policy contains key directives to enhance the ability of my office to obtain the evidence required to secure convictions for SGBC. And this policy was the outcome of extensive consultations within my office, as well as with UN agencies, state parties to the court, civil society and academia. My office's implementation of this policy has helped to advance a culture of best practice in the investigation and prosecution of these crimes. And it was also the first time that such a policy was launched by any office of the prosecutor in any international court or tribunal. Following the launch of the policy, my office intensified training of staff to ensure that they are fully integrated, integrating a gendered perspective and a victim responsive approach to all aspects in all aspects of our work. We have sought to be innovative in utilizing the Rome Statutes legal framework to ensure that we fully present to the judges the gender aspects of the conflicts we investigate. We were also systematically implementing the policy to ensure we bring charges of sexual and gender-based crimes across our cases where the evidence supports doing so. Also, the policy underscores the importance of applying a gender analysis in all areas of our work. By paying speci special attention to how gender impacts the way in which victims experience harm, we were able to conduct investigations and prosecutions that more fully reflect victims' harm. In the context of our preliminary examination, we analyzed, for example, allegations of sexual violence in detention against male detainees in Ukraine and in Iraq. In Nigeria, we analyzed whether there was a reasonable basis to believe that Boko Haram committed the crime of persecution on the basis of gender grounds against women and children and girls. In Colombia, we determined that there is a reasonable basis to believe that members of the armed forces, guerrilla and paramilitary groups committed sexual and gender-based crimes. We have been monitoring relevant national proceedings in Colombia, including those related to the investigation and prosecution of sexual and gender-based crimes. I am proud, therefore, to know that during my tenure, the office secured important successes in court and issued important policy papers on strategic priorities we set, from sexual and gender-based crimes 
to crimes against and affecting children and the protection of cultural heritage. We have lived those practices, those policies in practice. One cannot remain silent and indifferent in face of such atrocities. Never again must not ring hollow. It must mean something in tangible ter terms. Ladies and gentlemen, I have served my native country of the Gambia from, as uh, was kindly mentioned by uh, Linda Kasondi, Madam Vice President, from Clerk of Court and returning to my country after my studies to serve again, rising through the ranks from public prosecutor to attorney general and minister of justice over several years. And throughout those years, amongst my objectives were to hold perpetrators of the worst crimes to account, to bring a measure of justice to victims and to deter others from committing such crimes. I have served the ICC first as its deputy prosecutor for eight years, and then as its chief prosecutor with my nine year term just coming to an end last June. And I undertook that mandate with sheer determination, with complete independence and impartiality and without fear or favor. The era of impunity for atrocity crimes belongs to the dustbins of history. I was determined to do my part to see this aspiration become a reality. And sexual and gender-based crimes are also serious atrocity crimes. We must recognize them as such and do everything in our power to eradicate them. They are committed based on the victim's gender. Ladies and gentlemen, there is still a great work, a great deal of work for us to do to close the impunity gap for sexual and gender-based crimes. Academics, civil society, and policymakers can play a critical role in supporting and en enhancing the efforts that are being made to investigate and prosecute these crimes by amplifying the voices of victims and conveying critical co information about these cases to communities around the world who have jurisdiction to investigate. The jurisprudence of the court and the office's strategies and policies, the tools and practices can in, in fact provide important guidance to national jurisdictions and to actors who are investigating and prosecuting these crimes. I always, I'm always reminded of what Archbishop Desmond Tutu said. He said, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. And more than ever, more than ever before, the most vulnerable amongst us, the women, girls, children, need allies and advocates for justice. When they are abused, when they are exploited and are discarded by the powerful. This is a role that we have to play in eradicating the bias. And the primary responsibility to investigate and prosecute international crimes rests in the first instance with states. The unfortunate reality, however, is that far too often, states have failed to shoulder this responsibility. Similarly, I stress the importance that state adopt appropriate measures and strategies to end impunity for sexual and gender-based crimes and thereby contribute to their prevention of their, or their commission, including through ensuring the adequacy of their domestic laws and legal systems to properly investigate and prosecute them. And lastly, I believe that the international community must exert greater efforts to ensure effective accountability for all instances of international crime, no matter where they are committed or by whom in an impartial and a balanced manner. Now allow me to address you more broadly on my work at the ICC. No one said that addressing atrocity crimes and fostering an international criminal justice system were going to be easy. But these are goals that must be achieved for the progress of humanity. Nine years ago, when I was sworn in, I had no illusions about the enormity of the task ahead. With this mandate comes great responsibility, requiring focus, often self-sacrifice and fortitude. Nine years ago, I stated that justice, real justice, is not a pick and choose system. And that to be effective, 
to be just and to be a real deterrent, my office's activities and decisions must be based solely on the law and the evidence. We may operate in a political environment, but our work must be shielded and free from the winds and the whims of politics when those trends are not aligned with our collective obligations under the Rome Statute. And during my tenure, I have done my utmost to live by these convictions in the service of the Rome Statute. I have strived throughout to honorably and with integrity discharge a complex multifaceted mandate with independence and impartiality. And I have made my decisions with careful deliberations, but without fear or favor. Even in the face of adversity, even at considerable personal cost. As you recalled, I have been sanctioned by the Trump administration with serious implications for both my personal and professional life for doing my legitimate mandated work. I was denied a visa or my visa was canceled to the US. As you know, I do go to report in both my the, the Libya case and the Sudan case um, twice in each case uh, to the UN Security Council, but my visa was withdrawn and canceled and my personal account with the UN bank in the US were blocked. But this did not prevent me from doing my legitimate mandated work. The Biden administration recognized that legitimacy, that legitimacy of my work and in a short time lifted all the sanctions imposed on me and another colleague shortly after assuming office. Before the US sanctions, I have also received vicious attacks on me personally and on the court from my own continent and even from my own country, the Gambia, based on lack of understanding of my jurisdiction, false accusations of bias, propaganda, hateful and misleading rhetoric, and all of this was for doing my legitimate work. I have received threats and intimidations for my work in Palestine, Philippines, including racial slurs from President Duterte himself, and from various other sources and interested parties, both public and private. I have sought to focus not on the words and propaganda of a few influential individuals whose aim is to evade justice, but rather to listen to the victims who took, look to the court as a beacon of hope, as the last bastion of justice and accountability for atrocity crimes. Upon assuming office as prosecutor, the changes I undertook at the office were sweeping. I announced and quickly moved to take a number of initiatives concerning strategic direction, organizational management, and internal office culture. I adopted a new prosecutorial strategy with a major shift in how we investigate and build our cases. We enhanced our quality control mechanisms, streamlined and strengthened our administrative procedures improved transparency in how we conduct our work and made swift and significant efforts to build a positive office culture. Firstly, by setting up a task force on working climate to provide the best working conditions for staff and encourage a positive climate to work. I also immediately worked on the adopt and, and adopted a code of conduct for the office for appropriate behavior warranting of an international criminal law office, which included training of all staff, starting from myself and the deputy prosecutor and senior staff. I further instituted the core values of dedication, integrity and respect applicable to every single one of us in the office. These values were captured on posters and during my tenure, pasted across the entire office or at the bottom of every email and through a relentless focus on understanding what they mean in terms of concrete behaviors, top of our mind for all of us. And for these were not just decorative slogans, but standards I strictly applied for my office to live by. During my tenure, I endeavored to strengthen an office that is transparent, accountable at all levels, both in terms of performance and professional conduct. All this, Together with the team I led, we did in the most difficult of circumstances, with lack of sufficient budget, a global pandemic, 
attacks and threats, sanctions and all. I was able to lead my office to withstand all this. I am proud in my conviction that I left a vastly improved, well-functioning office with many dedicated and resilient staff. I am certain they will continue to be eager and enthusiastic to serve the cause of justice fairly and objectively as they have always demonstrated to me. Ladies and gentlemen, it has indeed been a roller coaster of a ride serving as ICC prosecutor. <laughs> Perhaps I can laugh about it now, maybe because I'm just thrilled that it is done. But on a serious note, it has been an absolute privilege to serve and have traveled through this period of history together with colleagues and partners, both within and outside of the court to bring justice for the sake of countless fellow humans who have suffered. And I was not expecting it to be easy and it has certainly not been easy, but I know in my heart of hearts, no matter the odds that all, at all times, I did everything to protect and bring to life the goals and values of the Rome Statute. Where I may have fallen short, I can assure you, it was not for lack of trying. I have, however, noted with deep regret that many, even the supposed allies to the court and the office, will support the work of the Office of the Prosecutor only when their ge geopolitical interests are not at stake. I have seen pushback on the work of the office if those interests were not served. I have seen attempts to influence my office's work, to intimidate or ignore me when that failed. I have seen supposed allies and so-called friends of the court snub me because I did not do what they would have liked me to do, that I did not understand how things work. Despite these pressures, both public and private, I never yielded. I did what I'm truly convinced was in the interest of the Rome Statute, and I am glad and proud of my service in that regard. As I vacated the role of the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, I left with one fundamental parting advice, that we all must remain firmly principled and vigilant in the service of international criminal justice and the ICC, of course. To stay resilient and impervious to political games and posturing, the future and legitimacy of the court depends on it. It is as simple as that. And I told them that don't let anyone deceive themselves or you into thinking otherwise. So no matter what the naysayers, the buyers and the politically interested would say or try to have one believe, the successes achieved including on being able to contribute to advancing the jurisprudence of ICL and IHL is a vindication an acknowledgement of my work as ICC prosecutor, always guided by the reality that the right thing must always be done. I work to the best of my ability at all times and that I was unwavering in my resolve to execute my mandate without fear or favor. I hope I have not been too long and I thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to interacting with you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Bensuda. That was a fantastic lecture. It was really nice listening to you, you know, starting from when you were a girl in the Gambia and where you are now, you have really, really skilled the heights. And I know a lot of people listening in today, tuning in from all over the world um, are just as impressed as I am. I can see we have a lot of participants um, who I'm sure have questions uh, for you. Um, and I would really want to ask uh, all our participants to direct their questions to the Q&A box um, instead of the chat. It will be easier for us to be able to, to get uh, Dr. Bensuda to answer your questions. Um, and um, just to acknowledge participants from Uganda, Kenya, Shikita from the Bahamas, we have Zambians who are joining us today. Of course, we have the Gambians who are very, very proud of uh, Dr. Bensuda with us here today. Um, um, we have, I saw some, some other participants from different places from the, from the UK and um, looking forward to facilitating the Q&A and I'll go straight to that. 
uh, led, we're starting with Yasin Huba. And Yasin Huba is saying, thank you very much for the enriching and inspiring lecture and asking what pathway should young women who study law ideally follow to have a career in international prosecutions? Um, then there's a second question from AK Sise Sise. Uh, thanks, Mrs. Bensuda. Your courage is admirable in the face of adversity. Um, she's, the question is, uh, you said you did your best during your tenure in office to advance the cause of justice for women. Do you think your achievements in this area are built upon and are you optimistic about the future insofar as Africans with African women's rights are concerned? So two very, very, very um, good questions there for our guests. And perhaps we can start with those. Dr. Bensude, if you're ready, um, we'll ask you to deal with um, what pathway should young women who study law ideally follow to have a career in international prosecutions? And then the second question from Sise about your achievements, um, are they being built on about the, and about the future uh, when, when it comes to women's rights, especially African women? Please take it away. Thank you very much, uh, um, Maria. For, and thank you to those who posed the, the questions. Um, I, I think you more and more what I have seen over these years is that international criminal justice is really uh, developing at a very fast rate. Um, it is one of the, um, maybe the, the uh, newest areas in international law that, uh, that uh, we see today. And I also see that as we go along, there are uh, already quite a few people, young people who are interested in this, uh, in this field. And uh, I had the privilege to um, uh, meet quite uh, a lot of young, young women from the continent who, um, who are um, uh, interested in, in studying international criminal law. Um, maybe the first thing that I would say is just to, to focus, to know what, uh, what you want and to go for it, uh, to be serious about it, to, do, to take every effort that you can um, to ensure that you're focused and you want to attain what you what you, you what you uh, uh, what your dreams are, what your aspirations are, and uh, um, of course it is at uh, um, uh, later on in life that you one would specialize. Uh, I'm I'm just taking here that you would you would naturally do do law, but you would later specialize uh, in the um, uh, topics that would lead you to this uh, area of international criminal justice. I can, I can say that it's a very interesting area. It is one that uh, probably I, I always like to say that it kind of sucks you in. Um, I remember when I left the Gambia to, to go to Rwanda, I was thinking of uh, perhaps doing two years and then to go back to the Gambia. But look at me where 20 years later <laughs> I am. So it is a very fascinating and interesting area that, and, and it is one that Really, when you when you when you um, work in it, you are um, bringing justice. Let me let me put it that way to a vast majority of a number of people, because mass crimes, mass atrocities affect quite a number of people. Um, uh, one of the things that really fascinated me when I went to Rwanda was the number of victims one has to deal with and the number of perpetrators that one had to deal with for the first time. So I, I would just advise that you um, concentrate uh, on, on and focus on what you want to achieve, what your dreams are. Um, the next question you, you said, uh, whether what I think that um, um, my achievements at the ICC are, are being built, built on. Well, I would love to think so. Um, of course, I am. I, I do know that there are some policies and guidelines and strategies that are already in place, which I have put in place during my time, which I know that we had already started to apply and to implement. So my hope is that uh, this is uh, going to continue with my successor in, in, in office. And uh, also um, uh, the fact that I, I do know I'm not beating my chest, but I do know that I have been very thorough in putting those policies in place and with wide consultations, both within and outside of the court. 
and I do not see any reason why the wheel should be invented, reinvented, uh, because already uh, there is best practices that was uh, that is in place, and and which I think that uh, my successor and those who who come after after us will will build on that. Uh, of course, we didn't do everything, so new things will be done. But I do hope that uh, um, they will build on on those successes and take the court to an even higher level. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Bensuda. There's um, two more questions. Um, we have a question from Pamela Wako, and she's asking: In Kenya, we are in an electioneering year. What can you advise the women of Kenya, especially in view, um, I guess she's asking in view of the, the fact that it's an electioneering period, what your advice would be to the women? Um, and then my own question is, you know, what, what is your view on the, the vulnerabilities that uh, women are exposed to by the conflicts in uh, the Ukraine? and the ensuing refugee crisis. What's, what's your view on, on that particular uh, issue? Um, with, uh, with respect to well, what I can advise Kenya, I, I, I always um, say my country. <laughs> Kenya, <laughs> I have quite a history um, in that country. And, and, and I, I, I must say that, um, it's 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 very limited what I can say at the moment, as a former prosecutor, and also knowing that uh, both cases can be resuscitated at the ICC. It's, it's it's not dead and gone. It's 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 possible to do that. Um, I I really do not wish to um, uh, go into into that just for uh, avoidance of conflict conflict of interest. So, but what I, 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 I can also say to women in general is that we, we cannot continue to be the uh, kingmakers, clapping for you know, the male counterparts, uh, ushering them on and uh, pushing them and supporting them without us coming forward to also um, ask for those positions, seek those positions, because I know that women have the capacity and the capability to lead, uh, um, uh, become leaders, great leaders. Women can actually be very, very great leaders. So we we need, as a woman folk, to also start thinking in that uh, in those uh, uh, terms that we are and should be in a position to also assume uh, uh, leadership positions in our country and to also contribute and do our, our, our best uh, for our countries, our individual countries. And uh, perhaps another thing is whatever the case may be, uh, we need to avoid uh, the violence. We need to avoid the violence and we should, uh, as women, um, I would encourage that for the, um, uh, to keep highlighting this and to keep uh, um, bringing it to the minds of those who are in leadership positions that we cannot have violence during, during elections. One can express your uh, um, <laughs> where, where, wherever you want to support without being violent or without uh, committing violence against other people. Um, this is something that I have persistently said when I was there at the at the ICC. Um, the, the, about Ukraine, it is really unfortunate what is happening in Ukraine now. I, I, I think we all we all know. Um, I'm also not going into the um, justifications or non-justifications of what is happening. I, I don't think it is my place to do that. But uh, I really deplore the, the violence that is ongoing. Just this morning, I think, I, I heard the, um, uh, the report that about 4 million people, most of them women and children, have already been displaced. This is very, very uh, um, unfortunate. And what can they do? They can only uh, run away to seek refuge somewhere and perhaps be able to come back later. But uh, it is really um, very, very sad what is, what is happening right now in, in Ukraine. And uh, yeah, I mean, the way it is happening and uh, we know the dynamics, we know um, 
the, the partisans to this uh, conflict. I, I think they need to, as quickly as possible, do whatever is, uh, they can to bring this to a stop. Because again, it is only the um, ordinary people, mostly, who are suffering mm -hmm. in this conflict. Conflict can never resolve anything. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and thank you for that, Dr. Bensudas. There's a question. I think I'll just take the last round of questions. Um, and there's some questions here from, one is from Matthews Chione. I hope I've said that correctly. And he posits that the judgments of the ICC are often ignored by states. Do you think the court should improve on enforcement mechanism? And then uh, Bibian Muhanguzi uh, is asking, Bibian is from Uganda, asking about your experience with racism, xenophobia and other intolerances, uh, sexism as a woman and, and you're an African. I guess he's saying how you view that, uh, you know, uh, in the in the background of you being a woman and an African, if at all, did you deal with the same? So there's a question about that, and the other one about enforcement of judgments by states. Um, the the first one with respect to enforcement of judgments, um, I, I I just hope you are not um, you are not uh, 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 mixing this up with the ICJ, which is the International Court of Justice which gives uh, judgments, but those judgments, um, it's to states. Um, ICC is about individual criminal responsibility. And uh, the, the, um, we, uh, the judges either issue um, authorized investigations, which it is the office of the prosecutor to do, or they confirm charges, which is after someone has been arrested and brought before the court, the charges are confirmed and the trial starts. And it also um, issues judgments in which uh, the person is either convicted or not convicted. And when, he, when the person is convicted, he is taken to, to, to jail. We have a few uh, of them now who are already serving their sentences in jail. So it is not really um, directed against states. It is against individuals. And uh, the enforcement mechanisms that we have in place we ensure that the person will serve uh, their jail term uh, wherever um, uh, it's supposed to take place, either in The Hague or in, this, in, an, in another state party that has agreed to, to accept convicted persons from, from the ICC. Maybe um, the area you, you're more particularly thinking about is uh, with respect to the warrants of arrest. ICC judges uh, issue warrants of arrest after the uh, um, uh, ICC prosecutor uh, applies for them. And uh, um, we have seen over the years that this is uh, uh, very, very problematic um, for those warrants to be executed by states parties. I do not need to go into the, um, the, the, the story of Sudan, for instance, and Omar al-Bashir. When, when warrants were issued against him and he was uh, supposed to be arrested, but this, this took over 10 years for, for any country to, to take action on that. And especially um, when, when an arrest warrant is issued against any individual, anywhere you go that is a state party to the Rome Statute, they have an obligation to arrest that individual and to send you to the ICC. This is an obligation that countries themselves have signed for under the Rome Statute as state parties. So it is an obligation for them to do that. But we have seen several times over the years with that warrant pending that um, it is uh, unfortunately politics would trump, <laughs> politics would trump uh, justice, the course of justice. And this is, this is an area that definitely there is a problem but again, it's political will that is needed by states who have signed and ratified the Rome Statute and are members of the ICC. By signing and ratifying, you are undertaking that you will support the ICC and that you will execute the warrants that are issued by the judges of the ICC. And you will do everything to help uh, with logistics and, and, and things in your country for ICC investigators to go into the field. So this, this I, I know is an area that uh, is a, is a weak, um, weak, weak part of the ICC with respect to 
the politics and the pol uh, political will as well as uh, the um, uh, justice aspect of it. It's it's uh, and 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 wanting to, having to arrest when we see that many people really many countries don't want to to do that. That's that's already a weakness. And uh, with respect to racism, xenophobia, and uh, sexism. I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that uh, um, one experiences, experiences this, even if it's uh, at most times very nuanced, but you, you do, uh, in my position, I have been, been asked quite often, how do you feel uh, being an African uh, and being a woman and some people even add being a Muslim that you are prosecutor of the ICC. I mean, you only have to read into those words to know that uh, there is some form of racism in it, there's sexism in it, and, and xenophobia. You will, you will read that. But I always uh, tell them that um, I'm very, very happy to be a woman, but I know this is not the qualification for me to sit here likewise an African or a Muslim. Um, these qualifications that I have and experience is what um, made states to have that confidence to, ele to, to elect me into this uh, position. But over the years, uh, in some form of an, or another, you, you just uh, hear things, you hear words that, that, that show you that um, people are completely not being, um, uh, non-racist or um, not being uh, sexist, uh, but I, I, I handle it quite well. I handle my own. I, uh, I think that uh, um, uh, being a woman should not uh, prevent you uh, or stop you from holding your own um, as, as best as you can. And I have over the years, uh, I think I've done it quite well. Okay, um, I know I said I was taking the last question, but there are three questions that are the same, uh, centered around uh, sexual violence. And um, one is from Christine Kipsang in Kenya. She's asking about um, what, you, what you'd propose as um, electoral law reforms. I know it's a bit broad, but maybe you can just give um, your idea, you know, on one or two points that, um, we can actually look out for in terms of improving or you know ensuring it doesn't happen. Um, and then there's Veronique Wright, uh, who's congratulating you and proud of your achievements. The question is also around sexual violence. Um, what's your advice for those who still believe that victims of sexual violence should not be provided so much protection, quote unquote, as it shifts the balance of justice against the accused? Um, that is very similar with the third question um, in the chat, um, which was um, from Steve Mudemba, who's asking, uh, now that rape is recognized as a crime against hum humanity, uh, he says uh, in brackets, especially when used as a weapon during war, what can states or ICC do to deal effectively with the same? Uh, women form the majority of the victims of this crime. How does ICC? or other international organizations assist the victims. I know you touched on that when you spoke about the innovations or what stands out in the Rome Statute when it comes to the recognition of the victims, but perhaps you can just highlight it um, briefly for, for our members attending. Thank you. I, 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 I have um, deliberately um, went into detail on explaining uh, the opportunity that is provided in the Rome Statute. Um, really, the R Rome Statute uh, is very, very adequate and very comprehensive when it comes to sexual and gender-based crimes. And this is why, uh, as I explained before, I just jumped on the opportunity. And I said that there is so much that can be done. That's why I came out with a policy barely two years after I was elected into office. I came with a policy on sexual and gender-based crimes. And uh, perhaps uh, there can be a way of, of, of asking for, for this policy uh, because it was published and it was freely given uh, out. 
maybe it is something interesting to to share with your with your colleagues but i i i have uh, there um uh, and during my term just take taken uh, a, a a very 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 important uh, step regarding how to handle this first and foremost you need the laws you need the laws so one has to look at what what they have at home domestically what you have at home whether it's adequate whether you need to improve it and maybe that's that's where i think you would you would start with there should also be a lot of sensitization about this uh, particular kind of crime because i uh, you will observe that in all conflicts all conflicts despite the the um, the advances that have been made at international law in all conflicts you still see that sexual and gender based crimes happen or in most conflicts i i can even say in all conflicts because we've seen it we've seen we've seen the reports where witnesses to um, all the reports that have been uh, are being given regarding uh, sexual and gender based crimes so domestically i think this it's very very important to look at your laws and to be able to bring them in line there is already guidance uh, um, regarding how those laws can be um, can ensure that they are adequate to investigate and prosecute sexual and gender based crimes this is uh, this is important to do and also apart from the sensitization the training the training is also particularly important regarding whether it is to investigate or whether it is to prosecute these uh, these crimes but even at the level of the police even at the level of the police training should be there and i i have suggested over and over again and said that this is particularly something that maybe we can even consider um, um uh, making reference to and high high schools, seeing how it can be subtly um, uh, uh, taught in schools, so that uh, from a very early age, uh, people are aware that this is a scourge that we have to eradicate. We cannot allow to to go on. So much can be done. A lot can be done. Um, and let let no one think that uh, oh, I'm only one person. I can't do much. We need to continue to collaborate and, and see how we can uh, advance this, uh, this agenda of eradicating sexual and gender-based uh, violence. Um, there was the question about that so many laws uh, are being uh, put in place and that it kind of tilts the balance against the, the accused. In the first instance, this accused person or these accused persons should not be committing these crimes should not and for a very very long time we have seen we've seen that uh, um, women don't really get the justice that they deserve in suffering for these crimes and that there were many loopholes and many many um, many areas in which could easily be used to uh, free the individual that has committed this uh, uh, atrocious crime so um, I do not think that the laws can 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 be uh, um, uh, so protective of the of the woman as to tilt the balance against against those uh, the individual who has uh, committed it. I keep saying men because I know that women can also uh, commit commit these uh, the, these acts. So I, I I believe that it is it is uh, the right thing to do. It is the right path to take and uh, we we have to uh, ensure that what used to happen i mentioned in my remarks that even in the nuremberg trials the chief justice uh, um, uh, the chief prosecutor jackson did not charge sexual and gender based crimes and we have seen over the years that uh, even in conflicts in major conflicts we have seen that sexual and gender based crimes were not uh, charged directly they were even called outrages of personal dignity and, 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 and things like that. So it is time we take the bull by the horns and give the protection that is, this, this is deserving of, of these women who are victims of these very uh, serious crimes. Um, I, I also want to acknowledge uh, uh, Ms. Veronica Wright, 
um, and, uh, um, and also to thank her as well for all the work that she is also doing in this, in this area, both at the ICTR and uh, even before leaving the Gambia. We've, we've worked together. So um, uh, thank you uh, very much, Veronica. I'm, I'm happy that you are, you are, you are in this, uh, in the um, participants. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, I have a fun name for her. She's uh, Rakaji, which means my little sister. So <laughs> thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy to, to, to know that you're amongst us this afternoon. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, all good things, uh, they say, must come to an end. And we are really at the tail end of this wonderful, wonderful talk by Dr. Bensuda. I particularly want to thank you for joining us and finding time and even show off your lovely Gambia. Um, I don't know where you where that background is, but it's, it's, it's quite in Mali. Ah, this is Mali. This is ah. in Mali. Um, it is in relation to the work I did of preserving of um, uh, bringing charges against someone for destruction of cultural heritage in oh. Timbuktu. Yeah. Fantastic. We learn something new every day. <laughs> so really, thank you for, for the wonderful presentation, the encouragement, and just just making it uh, really possible for us to hear your your you know your words of wisdom and experience. Um, allow me to now then hand over to your president, uh, Saluta, and he's um, representing the Gambia and president of the Gambia Bar Association. And he'll be giving the vote of thanks as he should rightfully. And just uh, to say thank you once more for joining us. Over to you, Salu. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, I must firstly um, apologize that I cannot have my camera on because I have some bandwidth challenges. So kindly indulge with me. Um, when you call me her president, I was sort of like, you know, I was like, almost like, oh my God, I mean, I'm so um, thrilled and privileged. Uh, we're wearing these um, very big shoes. Um, um, as a Gambian, you know, we all grew up having great pride and admiration for the achievements of, we call her Antifatu <laughs> in, our, in our country. It's Antifatu to, to us, um, but I'll follow protocol and call her Dr. Fatu from uh, Bensuda. Uh, first of all, um, good afternoon to you and good afternoon to Linda, our dynamic vice president and chair of the CLA Africa Hub and members of the CLA president and other participants distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It is really a great honor and privilege for me to deliver the word of thanks on behalf of the CLA Africa Hub after listening to a very captivating and brilliant lecture by Dr. Fatu Bensuda, former prosecutor of the ICC in commemoration of the International Women's History Day, which takes place annually from the 1st of March to the 31st. It is a month dedicated to celebrating women's contribution to history, culture, politics, and society, and is observed annually over the world. I dare say with humility, I must, that we, this, we the CLA Africa Hub, could not have chosen a more eminent person to deliver this lecture on this very germane topic. We sincerely thank Dr. Fatu Bensuda for accepting our invitation despite the short notice and I think she has done justice to this topic. We are very proud and privileged to have such an illustrious daughter of Africa in the person of Dr. Fatu Bensuda to be our guest speaker. Dr. Fatu Bensuda, who I fondly call Antifatu, epitomizes excellence, professionalism, decorum, dedication and dedication to global justice and accountability, as well as humility. Madam Fatu Bensuda has inspired a generation of women and girls in our beloved country and beyond and the continent. Through her great work, being the first woman and first African to serve as the prosecutor of the International Court of Justice. 
imagine starting off as a court clerk in the smallest country of Africa and reaching the highest echelon in legal practice as ICC prosecutor. This is by no means a little feat. Dr. Fatou Ben Sridhar has reached the zenith of the profession to share hard work, dedication, professionalism, and tenacity, despite all the bias and challenges she faced as a woman and as an African. And as she said, she was never, she didn't even see a glass ceiling. She just went ahead and worked very hard with a clear focus and purpose. Linda, I must add, in addition to the many awards and accolades you listed, on the, on the 8th of March this year, Dr. Fatu Ben Shuda was recognized by the prestigious Chatham House amongst the women who have actually shaped the world, meaning she has left an indelible mark in the world. Being a girl dad, I have a little daughter, I'm very much excited about this year's team, the deniers. For me, pardon me if I'm speaking from a position of privilege as a man, um, breaking the bias means a world that is diverse, equitable, inclusive, and progressive for everyone, where men and women have equal opportunities to achieve and realize their dreams and aspirations. Together, we can all break the bias in our homes, workplaces, and various walks of life in order to give women and young girls the opportunity to thrive and to be seen and be heard in the, in the same measure like boys and men. Therefore, as stakeholders, it is not enough just to realize that there's, 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 there's bias, but it is important to take concrete steps to end the bias, to ensure that going forward, let's say even starting with the Commonwealth Lawyers Association, to make sure that we have women are adequately represented at all levels, particularly when it comes to decision-making um, positions. On that note, I would sincerely like to thank Dr. Ben Schiller for really a wonderful public lecture, a very engaging lecture. And I think um, she, it has given us all food for thought. And uh, we're very, very proud of her as a jurist, as an African, and as a guest for your kind of attention. And I hope we will we'll engage um, Dr. Ben Shudder more because we really have a lot to learn from her. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Sal, uh, for that wonderful vote of thanks. I'd like to ask, I'm sure Dr. Ben Shudder, but Dr. Ben Shudder is very happy to hear from you and all the accolades that you have given to her. I'd like now to ask Linda Kasonde to say the final word and close this webinar for us. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. And thank you, Sally, for that excellent uh, vote of thanks. I couldn't have said it better myself. Uh, Dr. Bensuda is truly an example of African excellence and all that we aspire to as, as lawyers in this profession. Um, my favorite line uh, from Dr. Ben Suda's uh, speech, and I'm paraphrasing here, is we cannot continue to make men kingmakers when we women have the capacity to attain leadership positions ourselves. Indeed, that is what it means to break the bias. And we thank you for being a shining example of that. Um, thank you so much for spending your time uh, with, with us. Um, we're happy to say that this uh, lecture has been recorded for all posterity and will be uploaded onto YouTube for everyone to watch again, should you wish to do so. And please do share it, all of you who have watched it uh, with those who could not make it. Um, I would again invite all of you to uh, visit our website uh, to learn more about the CLA and uh, indeed to become members of the association. It, it is indeed a, a great association that um, stands for high and lofty ideals. And um, I think the legal profession would do well to, to be a part of it. So thank you once again. Um, we couldn't have asked for a better speaker. 
And thank you to Maria and Salyu as well for the moderation and for the vote of thanks. And of course to Claire, who's in the background, um, who's been fantastic for us in the Secretariat for all her hard work. Thank you to, to you all for participating and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.